Um, well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining me today. Thank you very much for joining me here. And thank you for the Virtual Day of the Midwife uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to present today, part of my PhD study. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I'll be setting part of my PhD research, for which I'm being supported by two fantastic supervisors, as you can see on the slide, Professor Flora Douglas and Professor Katrina Kennedy. And today I will be presenting you my literature review of my PhD that explore women experiences of free birth, where I will propose a new definition of free birth. So I hope that you find this session thought provoking and I'm looking forward um, to the discussion and the questions and answer at the end. I'm gonna do the presentation mostly in English. Well, not mostly in English, uh, but as you can probably guess from my accent and my background, I do speak Spanish and English. So I'll be happy to answer questions in either one of those two languages on the question and answer session. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please, Stella? So today I'm going to be setting my presentation around free birth, uh, my literature review, which has been recently published just this week. Um, so we will set the link on the chat at the end. Um, but before we start, I think it's important that we realize what it is that we are going to be talking about. So free birth is currently defined as the delivery decision to give birth at home without regulated healthcare professionals, either midwives or doctors present in countries where maternity care facilities are available and relatively easily accessible. The first reports of women deciding to free birth, to give birth without, without an attendant, a professional attendant present, um, appeared in the, light, in the late 1950s in the United States, and that was at a time of high medicalization of childbirth and a lack of maternity care choices. And the last decade has seen an apparently increased number of women opting to free birth, particularly since COVID, but we don't really know because the exact prevalence of this phenomenon is, is unknown. They are varying local estimates between countries, between three to 20%, depending on the paper, of home births are uh, free births in high income countries. But given that the number of home births in these countries are already low, at less than 1%, it is likely that free birth may only represent a really small proportion of the amount, or total amount of births in high-income countries. The lack of reliable records of free birth and the incident of free birth also means that the impact of this practice in outcomes, in maternal and neonatal outcomes, remains unknown. So we don't know if it's safe, if it's risky, we don't know, we just don't have data. But despite this relatively small size of this phenomenon, there has been an increased interest in, in academic publications on this topic in the last 20 years. Uh, there's a limited amount of research, as I'm going to share with you in a minute, but there's also an increased number of opinion pieces, editorial pieces, where free birth is often framed either as a controversial choice or as a form of resistance to existing maternity care provision. And that means that the academic discussion of free birth has, has unearthed underlying ethical debates about the boundaries of women autonomy in childbirth and also the boundaries of uh, moral accountability for safeguarding the unborn baby. So as I mentioned, we have a limited amount of research and most of it has exclusively focused on understanding women individual motivations to free birth. Why women free birth? Why are they choosing to give birth unattended? Previous reviews on this topic have identified traumatic or negative experiences of maternity care, the rejection of medicalized model of care, or unequal power dynamics with care providers as influencing factors in women's decision to free birth. But most of these reviews reflected a very small number of publications, which means that there is a limited evidence on this topic. So this is why I decided to do my literature review. Uh, Stella, could you do the next slide, please? So what I conducted was a systematic qualitative evidence synthesis, and this is what I'm presenting you today, where we wanted to explore women motivations to free birth. We wanted to update our review with more contemporary publications that have been published since the last uh, reviews were carried out. But we also wanted to address and answer questions that were not yet covered from previous reviews. And those are like, how do women who free birth perceive maternity care? And most importantly, what is the care experience for women who free birth? So how do they care for the pregnancies and for the birth in the pregnancy leading to free birth and during free birth? So we develop a review protocol. We uh, 
follow librarian consultation and we decided to search the databases that you can see on the screen and we carried out the searches in May 2022 and we updated this search just before preparing for publication in August 2023. We included studies between 2007 um, and up to the time when we carried the searches. The reason to limit it to 2007 is that the first empirical publication that included women who free birth was published in 2006. We also restricted inclusion to only high income countries because free birth is a term that is only used currently in this context where access to healthcare facilities is relatively unproblematic. We included uh, qualitative papers mostly, but also accepted mixed methods papers with qualitative data. And we included both uh, primary studies, but also uh, published dissertations. When a dissertation had been published in a journal article format, then just for easiness of the review, we, we included the journal article over, over the dissertation. Importantly with this review is that we, just not, we did not just want to describe and summarize what the previous research has said. We wanted to achieve a complex new understanding of women perspectives of rebirth. So we chose a methodology to analyze the data that is called thematic synthesis. And for those of you who are not familiar with this method, it's grounded on a critical philosophy, which means that the researchers believe, so in this case, my beliefs and my perspectives, mediate the process of synthesizing the data and generating new insight. So my position as a feminist, as a UK midwife, as a mother who made no normative choices in my pregnancy, although I did not free birth, influenced the analysis of data. Particularly when I look specifically in the, in the pool of data at issues of power and reproductive agency reported in women's accounts of free birth. But while this influenced the analysis of data, I, um, I had reflexive discussions with my supervisors, which helped me to generate findings that are not just my subjective perception of the findings, they are grounded in the review data. Um, so next slide, please. So we carry out the searches and we included a total of 22 papers in, in this review. These were two dissertations, 19 qualitative papers, one mixed method survey study, and the publication range, as you can see on the slide, were from 2008 to 2023, and from 10 different countries. So there were six publications from the United States, five from the UK, three from Sweden, two from Australia, and then one from Netherlands, one from Norway, Poland, Ireland, Canada, and Denmark. And the quality of the included studies was generally good with some minor methodological limitations, but overall was good quality studies. Most of the studies focus on understanding why women choose free birth or why women choose to birth outside of the system. And only eight studies that we included reported how women experience free birth or maternity care while making this choice. The studies that were exploring birthing outside the system combined unassisted births as free birth with also assisted births such as home births with risk factors, birth attended with unregulated birth workers or home births with midwives. And it was not always possible to differentiate between these two subgroups from the researchers' interpretations, but we were very careful to only include quotes from women who free birth in the data for analysis in this review. All these studies together incorporated data from 135 qualitative survey answers, 195 individual interviews, for which 152 were women who either free birth or considered it. And the demographic profile of the women in these studies is difficult to outline because the reporting data varied between papers. But approximately 77% of interviews were uh, multiples women, 13% were first-time moms, and in another 10%, the parity was not reported. Ethnicity was also, not re was also reported only in six studies, and it reflected a majority of white women. And when education was reported, most women were highly educated. But again, not many papers reported on education levels. Next slide, please. So we analyzed the data and we generated three main analytical themes in response to each of the review questions. So the first theme, a quest for a safer birth, describes the factors that influence women's decision to free birth. The powerful and powerless midwives describe women's perceptions of the care providers, who were mostly midwives in the included studies, but also sometimes obstetricians, and how these perceptions of the care providers influence their decision to free birth. 
And the last theme is rights of self-protection that describes women's care experiences and self-care practices in the pregnancy leading to free birth. So I'm gonna now describe you a bit more in detail each of these findings. Uh, next slide, please. So in a quest for a safe birth, as I say, describe women motivations and factors that influence them in their choice, in the decision to free birth. It was very clear that women's journey to free birth was in most cases the result of a really complex process of decision making, where they were seeking a safer birth than what they had experienced in previous pregnancies. 14 papers out of those 22 reported how personal or vicarious negative experiences of care uh, were at the common ground for women's decision to free birth. And these experiences took place in hospitals, but also in midwifery settings and in home births. And negative experience range from dissatisfaction with the care provided to traumatic events of abuse, coercion, and unconsented practices. Only three papers reported cases where free birth was actually a positive decision influenced by previous experience, previous positive and empowering experiences of birth and of care. And another three papers mentioned were um, anecdotal data where free birth was not a choice as such, but more a possibility that women prepare for due to very fast previous births. So these previous negative experiences influence what matter to women and what they perceive as safe care. So 14 papers describe how women's belief, they, they believe that physical safety is best protected by minimizing disruption to the birth physiology. And emotional safety, which, equal, which is equally important for women, uh, is achieved by keeping control over the decision-making process. And women believe that both elements of safety, both the physical and the emotional safety, are threatened by institutionalized maternity care, where hospitals are perceived as sites of power that over-medicalize over birth or strip women of their autonomy. Hospitals were only seen as the safer option only if complications arose. And to illustrate this, let me read you one quote from uh, a paper from Australia, from Jackson et al. Um, that a woman participating in that optic free birth said, nothing that can happen to me or my baby at home could be much worse than what my second baby and I experienced in hospital. I will never subject myself, my baby or my family to such an ugly, traumatic and dehumanizing experience again. So we're having those negative experiences where uh, health uh, services have already proven unsafe for these women, either physically or emotionally or both. So in this quest for safer experience, free birth was rarely the women's first option. Most women in the included studies try in the first place to secure access to a midwife attended uh, home birth or midwife attended birth, but they fail to do so due to structural barriers in home birth provision. So for example, in studies from the United States of Canada, the absence of regulated midwifery in certain areas uh, restricted access to attended home births. In other countries where midwifery is a regulated profession, there was either a lack of available midwives or a strict regulation of midwifery-led services that made access to home birth uh, care really difficult. So for example, some women were unable to secure access to midwifery-supported home births if they did not have, and quote, this is the worst, anything other than a perfect obstetric history, or if they didn't live within an established distance from a hospital. Other women, try to hire independent midwives or private midwives as an alternative to publicly funded care. But they were faced again with similar barriers, lack of midwives, a strict regulation of independent midwifery practice, with the addition now of the financial cost of covering this option. And this inability to access midwifery attended home birth made some women feel frustrated, unsupported, and in the words, being backed into free birth. Next slide, please. So they tried to secure access care with a midwife, but at the same time, they had negative experiences in the past with maternity services. So they wanted to have a midwife, but this desire to have a midwife coexisted with the mistrust of institutional midwifery. And this mistrust was based on two contrasting perceptions. One, as you can see on the left side of the slide, midwives as powerful authorities aligned with the institutional system, or on the right side, midwives as powerless practitioners that were restricted in their ability to support individual choices. So let's focus first on the uh, powerful midwives on the left side of the slide. 
Seven studies reported how in previous pregnancies, women had experienced power struggles with the care providers. And this was both midwives and obstetricians. And these power struggles eroded women's trust in healthcare professionals. Midwives were seen, and obstetricians too, but mostly midwives, were also seen as taking a position of authority or in charge during birth, for which women had no power to argue. The implicit primacy of the care provider's technical knowledge over the women's embodied knowledge reinforced this power imbalance, and they make women feel that their concerns, their sensations, their needs were ignored or dismissed. And to stay in control for the birth, women described they needed to actively fight or resist this authority, which was not always easy. And alongside these power conflicts, in six studies, also women describe institutionalized midwifery as medicalized, aligned with the obstetric model of care, and therefore unable to provide an alternative to obstetric care. Because midwives were perceived to medicalize the process through clinical checks and interfering in the natural flow of birth, then the presence of midwives at birth was sometimes seen as a threat to the birth safety. In contrast with these negative perceptions of midwives, on the other side, as midwives as powerless, um, women could also see midwives as disempowered practitioners with limited ability to support them with the normative choices. So even if midwives wanted to help, they couldn't. So this limited ability was related in 10 papers with a strict midwifery professional and employment obligations that forced midwives to work within certain regulatory parameters. Other papers also mentioned fear of bad outcomes or litigations and a strong influence on midwives' readiness to support out of guideline choices. But despite these generalized negative perceptions of institutional midwifery, women still wanted to find a distinct, unique midwife who will share the same values and listen to their wishes. Yet, in 11 studies, uh, women reported how fragmented model of care and lack of continuity of care prevented women from building trusting relationships with the different midwives they met. And midwives unknown to the women were seen to bring uncertainty to the birth process, which made some women decide to free birth despite the availability of publicly funded midwifery attending home birth care. So they almost say like, oh, it's a, it's a lack of draw. It's like, it's, it, you don't know who's gonna come on the day and I don't wanna risk it and having someone who is not gonna be attuned to my needs. Um, next slide, please. So in this complex process of decision-making, depending on when the decision to free birth was made, women had diverse forms of pregnancy care. Most of them who aim to have a like-minded midwife at the birth mostly engage with usual in-system antenatal care. Those who consider free birth from early stages of the pregnancy opt for something in between or out of system care. In between care means seeking out of consultations, perhaps one scan, perhaps a blood test, perhaps a well-being check at the end of the pregnancy, or accepting a specific antenatal test in combination with self-care. Out of system did not mean a lack of care. Women who flew birth did not forego care. They have varied self-help, self-care practices. So some women did similar monitoring as a midwife would do, like taking the blood pressure, auscultating the fetal heart rate, urinalysis, tracking the fundal height. For many women, however, self-care went beyond risk detection into positively setting the scene for free birth. So they focus on nutrition, exercise, reducing the stress, meditation. In between care, that bubble in between that we have in the, in the slide, in between care or selective engagement with, with maternity services was not just a decision in terms of how to care for the pregnancy, but also a self-protection measure against negative encounters with healthcare professionals. And these negative encounters were reported again in 10 papers. So when trying to negotiate the care in the pregnancy leading to free birth, women experience again new power struggles with care providers in form of the negative manipulation tactics, such as lying, coercion, using exacerbated risk discourse, harassment, threats to withdraw care, inappropriate referrals to social services. So all these negative behaviors made women feel stigmatized and judged, and they created a great source of distress. And in some cases, this experience compounded women's previous trauma and reinforced their mistrust in the system, and then became the turning point that ultimately led to their decision to free birth. And this is 
greatly illustrated with this quote from a study from the United States, from Brown. It says, how I felt betrayed by the people I had trusted to take care of me. And that was when I realized I needed to start taking care of myself. In contrast, only five papers included anecdotal reports of women meeting supporting practitioners, supporting midwives, or supporting doctors who they were able to discuss their plan with. So unable to negotiate care inside the system and unable to discuss their plans with supportive uh, practitioners, women kept their intention to free birth hidden or they only disclosed it to very supportive individuals. And protecting their decisions sometimes mean, mean uh, making pre-planned tactics to play the game, such as booking and attending home birth while planning not to call the midwives or calling late to help, uh, calling late for help, pretending that it just happened so quickly that they just didn't get there in time. Self-protection also requ required women to engage in extensive research to inform their decisions, and that was reported in 11 papers. Women drew from diverse sources, such as professional advice from supportive midwives, midwifery textbooks, research, informal peer support networks, and this allowed women to utilize both technical and experiential knowledge to make decisions about their care and to create detailed self-care self plans. To maximize the safety of the birth, women prepare for everything. Some gather some basic equipment, others hire a doula or had a friend or relative present to provide emotional and logistical support. They also to prepare for potential complications. So some women plan to drive to the hospital uh, to call the uh, ambulance to manage complications or to call their backup midwife. But some women even educated themselves and the birth partners to be able to identify and respond to complications while, while they were waiting for that help. Only one of the included papers explored specifically women's experiences of rebirth, but other 12 papers describe included description of women's perceptions of the birth experience. Women describe the free birth as positive, empowering, easier than the previous birth. For some, free birth provided a healing opportunity to, for the previous traumatic experiences. And on, on the other hand, the women who had hoped to have a midwife and they were looking for a midwife pretty much until the very last minute also reported how at times they would have like a midwife present to guide them through the most intense moments of birth. Despite of this, and regardless of what influence women chose to free birth, women describe how taking full responsibility for the birth and for the birth journey generated a sense of personal transformation and empowerment. And this was evident uh, whether women ultimately free birth or not. Only two papers included reference to perinatal outcomes and reporting that no major complications were experienced by either women or the babies. And the impact of free birth on future birth was only explored in four studies. So, and there was no apparent consensus. Some women will decide to free birth again as the primary choice while others will still try to find a supportive non-midwife, and if unable to do so, repeat the free birth experience. Uh, next slide, please. So what I presented you today in these three themes is reflected in this graphic. So we have revealed with this review how free birth was rarely the women's primary choice, but it was the result of previous negative experiences of care and a context of restrictive choice within maternity services. And faced with these structural and relational barriers to access wanted care, women turned to self-care in the form of free birth to achieve a safer birth experience and to protect their reproductive self-determination. Women's right of autonomy, women's right for reproductive autonomy, it was recognized in all of the included in, um, countries from the included studies. But for most women in this review, this did, didn't translate into a de facto ability to exercise the right of autonomy. Most women, as I mentioned initially, saw the home birth supported by a trusted non-midwife. Yet they have a, a series of structural barriers that are restricting them access to this care. And these barriers are not new. We already had previous research who has suggested that restrictive criteria for home birth care, a strict regulation of private midwifery practice, or unequal access to independent midwives, or restricted access to midwifery-led care for women with risk factors can turn home birth into an option that is only available to very few women. We also know about the impact of being cared for by a non-midwife in a continuity of care model. We know that it uh, um, enables women non-normative choices and it can lead to more empathetic care experiences. But for women in this review, this was also again rarely an option because except for New Zealand, no countries have yet scaled up continuity of midwifery care models to be in the standard provision. 
And even in high-income countries, most initiatives are located only in urban areas. And that creates disparities in access to interpartum care by a known midwife. But women not only experience you know, structural barriers to access care, they also experience relational barriers in the relationship with the healthcare professionals. Um, these women were uh, often characterized as deviant mothers and stigmatized for not complying with guidelines. Some women were pressured to comply and the behavior of the healthcare professionals escalated to disrespect, abuse, coercion. And unfortunately, we know that these behaviors are not ready in maternity care. Disrespectful care is a well-known factor leading to avoidance of wanted care. And in this review, that materialized as women not only choosing free birth, but hiding their choice from healthcare professionals to protect themselves from emotional harm. So in this context of reproductive injustice, self-care in the form of free birth became the tool that allowed women to protect their reproductive self-determination. And this is not new in women's uh, health care um, um, in general. The self, self, sorry, self care in response to inadequate mainstream health services uh, already happened in the 60s and the 70s with the, uh, with the feminist self health movement that emerged as an alternative to inadequate and disempowering gynecological care. So, like the self health feminists in the 60s and the 70s, but with the modern twist of using online peer support communities. Women in this review developed their self-care capacity by engaging in extensive research. And this is not unique for women who free birth because similar self-education journeys have been reported for women who plan home births, who plan water births with previous cesarean births, or who plan other non-normative choices. But while self-education empowers all the women to advocate for the choices, for women who free birth, they use this knowledge to strengthen their own capabilities to care for themselves and the babies. And they become almost midwives to themselves. Women implemented similar rituals of care as those done by midwives to minimize disruption to the birth process. They actively promoted and protected the physiology of birth, demonstrating a salutogenesis approach to care. They gathered equipment, they made emergency plans to deal with complications. So the extent to which women in this review developed thus their uh, self-care agency, we believe provides enough evidence to justify a change in our definitions of free birth. At the moment, our current definitions of free birth are institution-centered. They are focused on the absence of healthcare professionals or on the action. So we say free birth is unassisted birth. It focuses on what we as healthcare professionals do. Or it focuses or emphasizes free birth as a deviant behavior where women are opting out of re recommended options. So we say free birth is an outside of guidelines option. Uh, next slide, please, Stella. So considering the findings that I presented to you today, I'm proposing a new definition of free birth as the practice of self-care during birth in context where maternity care is readily available. And the context of self-care re remains relatively unexplored in the maternity context, despite the fact that the midwifery model of care is seeking to empower women to assume responsibility for their health. It has only been very recently that self-care has been advocated by the World Health Organization as an innovative approach to improve maternal outcomes in the low and middle income countries, where a context of too little, too late care negatively impacts maternal and neonatal outcomes. But the discussion of self-care does not appear to have expanded into countries of too much, too soon care. Yet the women in this review use self-care to address the most prevalent issues in this context, the overuse of medical interventions and the raising rates of uh, birth trauma. So we believe that describing, uh, defining free birth as a self-care instead of as the absence of care can reduce the stigma associated with this practice. It can lead to improvement in women's experiences of care because instead of trying to dissuade women from free birthing, maybe caregivers could strengthen women's self-care agency. Maybe we could share information to help them identify when further help is needed. And perhaps if we show trust in women's abilities to self-care and we show trust in women's ability to make autonomous decisions, then in return, we could be restoring women's trust in ourselves as caregivers, and that might increase their access to attended care. But most importantly, I think redefining free birth as a self-care practice is refocus our understanding of this phenomenon on the first-hand experience of women, what it is that women are doing. They are self-caring during birth, and that reinforces their role as responsible agents in their birth. Next slide. 
So before I finish, obviously, this is a review, like any piece of research has strengths and limitations. This is the most comprehensive, one of the strengths that is the most comprehensive today. We have included 10 publications from 10 different high-income countries. Previous reviews have only included up to maximum 10 different uh, publications. So we have the most comprehensive review today. But we believe the most important contribution of this review is the reconceptualization of free birth as a self-care practice. We have used a feminist lens to guide the interpretation of data, and this has allowed us to better understand how the context of maternity services and the power dynamics within it influence women's decisions to free birth. There were also limitations in these reviews. We only included papers from high-income countries because free birth is currently considered only uh, the way we define free birth is only in context, in context where medical facilities are readily, readily available. But on the other hand, the last decade has seen an advancement in the percentage of births attended by skilled healthcare professionals globally. And this has been mostly via scaling up hospital-based birth, not so much community-based uh, births. For some women in low and middle income countries, when they have access to these facilities, they are not accessing them due to similar reasons that women who free birth, such as perceiving hospital as not necessary for normal birth or experiencing negative interactions with healthcare providers or because the facility-based care is not culturally safe. So Sori et al. in the recent review on free birth recently argued that women in low or middle income countries might free birth too but we don't know yet, and further research is needed to understand if and how free birth happens beyond high-income countries. Another limitation of this review is related with the sample in included studies. They feature predominantly white, heterosexual, highly educated women. And it can be argued that the social location of these women facilitated their access to power and to make decisions and the resources to act on those decisions. And yet, we have anecdotal data from the United States suggesting that black women might be more likely to give birth and attend it, and that women and people identifying as LGBTQ have also been reported as more likely to consider free birth. But their voices are lar largely absent from the literature. So given the impact of intersectional oppression such as racism, homophobia, social vulnerability, low literacy on women's ability to make reproductive decisions, further research on free birth should seek to include also these demographic groups. And most of the findings we had are based on data from multiple women, and they were primary women in included studies, but the data referring specifically for those women was scarce, and that prevented further analysis in this demographic uh, group. So this is an important gap. We need to look at if there is any difference on why women, multiple and primary women, are deciding to free birth. Um, next slide, please. And before I finish, and we open the forum for questions, I am, as I said at the beginning, I'm very happy to say that if anyone wants to find out more about this review, the paper included, or want to cite my work, it has just been published this week in Midwest Free Journal, uh, open access, so everyone could access and read it. All my PhD-related publications will also be made available in my university profile that you could access within the QR code that was on the slide. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation today. And I'm looking forward to hear comments, questions, feedback now. Maria, do you mind to do that poll? Uh, yeah, that could be a good, good moment to do it now, yeah. Okay. So we have a poll. Um, with the start, put it up, Maria. Um, start. Yeah. Okay, cool. So before we go into questions, and I'm conscious that the results might be... Um, bias now for what I told you. Um, I'll ask the audience if you could maybe answer these two questions. Should midwives support free birth? Yes or no? And have you ever cared for someone who free birth? Uh, Still, I think they're saying on the um, on the chat that the last yeah. slide was missing. So if you could just move the slide there, so they could see the QR code. Okay, cool. I will. Um, just a second. Um, I'll I'll share that with them. I'm just allowing them to finish the the poll. Um, we have had fifty four participants. Can you see it on your screen, Maria? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. Okay, cool. So maybe 
to 30 seconds, we see. Uh, the number is not shifting. Okay, Maria, you can speak to the results. Yeah, so we have the results. 85% um, of the people who have replied have said yes, we should, midwives should support free birth. 15% have said no. And in the audience today, we have 62% of people who had experience of caring for someone who free birth or considering. 23% uh, not applicable, and 15% they did not have experience for caring for someone who free birth or considering. So, Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, let's go to the QR code. So that's, if you want to get in touch with Maria, um, that's her details. Uh, very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot of people reaching out and exploring further. Um, just conscious of time, but let's first go to the questions. I'll, we'll look at the questions, what questions we have. Um, we have a comment here from Marcus who says, thank you, Maria, that he finds your work incredibly interesting and enlightening. He's a father of four, and through his wife, they've experienced mostly good deliveries, thanks to the help of midwives. The choice towards free birth is strong. Economies as emotional protective measure as completely new to me. So yeah, um, a congratulations there in terms of very uh, insightful uh, study. Um, very interesting insights. Uh, thank you for the captivating presentation. Um, thank you, Maria. Uh, I think in the presentation you mentioned that in New Zealand, the, and someone here, Claire, says that we are seeing an apparent rise in free birth in New Zealand, uh, even with a publicly funded continuity of care model, which includes home birth. Your findings really resonated with Claire, and she's saying thank you. Thank you, uh, but I, this, I think this is a question. I imagine it must be difficult to find maternal and baby outcomes. Maybe you can take that, Maria. Yeah, so thank you very much for the comments. It's lovely. I'll begin to hear actually, Claire, what your experience is, because I've been hearing about that in New Zealand. And I think probably part of it could be, you know, even if it's continuity of midwifery care, it's a complex decision. So it might be another element that might be there. Um, that maybe women are not happy about the care provision. Um, there were women within the review that for for whom free birth was actually a positive choice uh, and a positive choice. It was not a response to reproductive injustice, but those were really a small amount of women. So I wonder if it might be something around that. Uh, in relation to the question of Kerry that says, um, it must be difficult to find maternal and baby outcomes. I think it would be pretty much impossible to do a, a study on this because there's no records of free birth. Free birth happens outside of the systems. Uh, sometimes we find out about free birth, but because of this stigma and this, uh, you know, judging women and the fear for potential negative repercussions from healthcare professionals, even if they free birth, women will hide that choice. So even if they access care postnatally, or, you know, just in the moment of birth, they might pretend of making it pass by a BBA, like a bomb before arrival, because they don't want to have the stigma associated with you made this on purpose. And, you know, you're, you're being a risky mother, you're risking your baby, you that kind of language is what women are finding. It would be very difficult to find um, and do a study on outcomes. I think any study that we could do will have to be based on pretty much self-reporting from women. And that means convenience sampling, so calling women to come to the studies and, you know, it's only who comes will get the answers. So we're very difficult. And even if we have a robust study that way, there will always be critics that will say, yeah, there's something in there. We could not compare outcomes with free birth, for example, with outcomes that we have in relation to midwifery led settings or home birth, because we will not have records. So it's very difficult, actually, to to do research on, on terms of outcomes. My main thing about research about outcomes, and I'm so glad this is coming up because actually it was one of the critics from the review when I tried to publish the paper is, when we look at outcomes, we're only looking at physical short-term outcomes. And it was clear for women in this review that that's not the only outcome that matters to women. Yes, it matters, of course, but it's not the only one that, that 
matters to women. So when we focus on the discussion around free birth so much around outcomes, we're just narrowing the focus on one tiny part of what matters to women. Physical outcomes matters to women, and they actually believe the way they are protecting those physical outcomes is by staying outside of the system because they already experience unnecessary over-medicalization on birth that puts them physically at risk and also psychologically at risk. So I think we need to be careful when we talk about outcomes with free birth that we just don't narrow it on that part because what matters to women is much wider holistic outcomes, short, long-term, family, psychological um and and social outcome also on the transition into a new family and, and motherhood. All right. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, I see we might we might take some questions off the myth of the conference, but there is one that uh, asks about how could you explain the notion of stigma around free birth in an era of choices for women? Now, that's a very interesting one. I think we have a rhetoric of choice, but we don't have a reality of choice. So I think it was Margaret Atwood that thing like, you know, as long as you run within the labyrinth, feel free to run wherever you go, but don't dare to get out of these things options. So I think that's what we're talking about choices. As long as you follow paths and, you know, you choose the choices that we're giving you, A, B, or C, don't dare to ask for D because we are telling you the acceptable options are A, B, or C. So we have a rhetoric of choice, but we don't have a reality of choice. And also within that rhetoric of choices, even A, B, and C, the positions we all have as women in the system is different on how you're going to be able to argue and how you're going to be able to have other choices. So my ability to exercise choices as a woman will depend on the midwife that is in front of me and is willing or not to support these choices. So... Autonomy is not something that is, happens to individuals, it's something that is relational and social. So my autonomy will also depend on your ability to put a barrier for me exercising that autonomy or actually help me and facilitate me to have those choices. So the stigma is around that, like we have a rhetoric of choices, but it's not any choice. We always say, and I hear that a lot when I talk about my research with people, um, oh, I do believe women have a choice and women have a right to choose. But that but is already limiting women's ability to choose. So that is the notion of a stigma. It's like if women are outside of what we consider is our safe line on the ground, then that's where the stigma comes around and we start judging them as unsafe mothers. All right. Thank you, Maria.